Thank you very much for inviting me to deliver this uh, presentation, short presentation on best practices in OER and also some case studies uh, with respect to how to reuse and remix existing open educational resources in uh, course material development and uh, course delivery. Uh, before we start, I must thank uh, Dr. Ramesh Sharma and uh, Dr. Manas Panigrahi of SEMCA for inviting me to deliver this uh, presentation. Now, uh, from my experience um, at Wawasan Open University in Penang, Malaysia, uh, I have <coughs> worked with uh, three types of uh, courses which are based on open education resources. Uh, you can call these three models. Uh, the first model I've worked with is the uh, remix and revise model. So in this model, we go out and look for open educational resources in a particular subject area, then adapt them to create a new uh, ODL course material. Uh, one of the examples was uh, a course called Web Database Applications, which I developed in 2012. It was a level 200 uh, course in a IT degree, uh, BTEC in IT. So um, uh, the, the way we went about developing this course is to first go out, uh, look for open educational resources from various repositories, um, which are in the areas of web database applications, mainly PHP and MySQL. Once we have identified the relevant material, we formed a course development team, which included academics, uh, instructional designers, the librarian, um, as well as some technical people from the IT support services, uh, so that the OER material can be developed cohesively. Um, we also had a external reviewer from a uh, uh, outside university who was a professor, usually an external reviewer in our process or at Wawasan Open University is associate professor or higher. So the, uh, the way the first model worked was that once we had ide identified all the course materials, or sorry, all the open educational resources that we can use in the course material development, we went ahead and hired a course writer who adapted uh, these open educational resources to an ODL context. So um, we, when we were selecting the OER, we specifically looked for uh, OER which were licensed under CC BY or CC BY SA because the university at that time uh, was going to adopt a CC BY SA license of its own. Um, now, the development process uh, in this particular case was interesting because we had to employ a uh, uh, additional level of quality assurance when it came to the course material development. Usually, once the uh, course writer uh, adapts the OER material, um, the academic in charge, who is called the course coordinator, along with another academic of the same field, uh, we called him a academic member, uh, vetted through the material which the writer had adapted. Um, once we uh, once we went through the material, uh, you know, based on our expertise, to add a uh, belt and braces kind of approach to the OER course material, we went ahead and found the uh, official technical manuals uh, from PHP as well as MySQL, which outlined the technology um, from the company itself. So um, then we took the material which we had adapted and cross-checked it with the uh, official manuals from the technology provider. And uh, surprisingly, uh, we saw certain mistakes in the OER material, which we had to rectify before it went through to the next phase. Now, um, although uh, materials are released as open educational resources, they are not 100% accurate when it comes to um, uh, technology, when it comes to the uh, integrity of the content. So it is actually crucial that uh, a proper vetting is done and also an additional layer of quality assurance is maintained to ensure that the OER material are suitable uh, for the university level. Once um, the uh, 
uh, once the adapted material were cross-checked, they were sent to the instructional designer who added the pedagogical aspect for distance learning. And then it went to the external reviewer who was a, pro a professor in that particular area. Um, the external reviewer reviews the complete course material uh, holistically and then provides his or her feedback. And based on that, the um, final version of the course material is developed and then sent for uh, the final editing. Now, that was one model. This was when we took uh, OER material from outside and put them all together. Um, these were compatible OER material, put them all together and created a new derivation or a new course material. Now, uh, in the process, we found out that uh, using OER in this manner to create uh, e-learning content um, reduced the amount of time uh, which was taken to develop a typical course material. Usually, uh, an audio course material at Pawasan Open University took around 12 to 18 months to develop. And with uh, the use of open educational resources in the course development, we managed to cut it down to around uh, 10 to 12 months. So there was a significant saving in time. Uh, furthermore, uh, we uh, saw that the resource utilization uh, in terms of uh, instructional designers, uh, editors were much more efficient. So uh, that was a additional benefit as well. However, um, uh, a, a surprising find was that the use of uh, open educational resources did not reduce the cost of uh, development of the material itself. So in other words, uh, the uh, material which was created using open educational resources cost as much, if not slightly more, than uh, developing it from scratch in-house. Um, I had re written a book chapter on this, uh, uh, published by Call. Uh, you can have a read of it as well, which compares the development of a material from scratch in-house and using OER. And there, there wasn't much monetary difference uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the two uh, models. However, uh, there were additional benefits which the OER brought in. So that was uh, a, a plus. The second model, uh, I have experience with is uh, mostly a wraparound model. So a course guide is developed, uh, which includes the introductions, the summaries, the activities, the self-tests, um, and things like that. Uh, however, the actual content was based somewhere else. It could be a video, it could be a wiki page, it could be an audio track, uh, it could be a animation. Uh, and these are available as OERs uh, outside uh, on the World Wide Web. So the course guide um, provided links to these materials. So how it would work is that the student would read the introduction of, uh, into a particular topic, then click on a link and go watch a video of around 10, 15 minutes, um, and then come back and do a self-test to see whether they have achieved the required learning outcome. Um, this was slightly easier to develop because you didn't have to worry about the compatibilities and also the liabilities when it comes to uh, mixing and matching open education resources. The licenses weren't that important because uh, the resources were based outside anyway, uh, residing in the original repositories, we were just providing links. However, there were problems with respect to broken links because sometimes uh, resources move from place to place. Uh, the links change, um, some resources are brought down, um, and things like that. Um, so uh, as, a, as, a, as a potential solution, uh, the institution experimented with a resource pack where they downloaded all the material, all the OER material available uh, or used inside the wraparound course guide or course material, and then gave it as a separate CD, a resource pack for the students to view offline. So that, that kind of uh, rectified that situation. The final model I want to talk to you about is uh, a learning objects model. Um, we used uh, the Rice University's connections platform, cnx.org. Now it's OpenStax uh, Connections. Um, we used the connections platform to create small uh, chunks or small learning objects of a particular 
course uh, or, or a particular topic. So uh, let's say, for example, electronic commerce. Uh, we took the course blueprint, which outlined all the topics uh, which need to be included in the course material. Then we built small uh, learning objects uh, within the connections platform. So uh, for a typical course material, around 100 or 150 subtopics or small uh, learning objects were created uh, on the connections platform. And these were independent, they were reusable. If there are similarities between electronic commerce in IT and introduction to electronic commerce in management, then these uh, RLOs could be reused. That was the whole purpose. Now, the connections platform is unique because it offers the ability to uh, use these uh, RLOs and put them together and create a course material on the fly. So that was the model we used. Um, it, uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, the course was uh, introduction to Java. So uh, basically writing uh, Java modules um, on connections. And there are plenty of uh, 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 plenty of uh, RLOs available on connections as well, written by other people. So the beauty of it is that you can reuse whatever's on connections and you can uh, write, uh, you know, material for the gaps uh, within your course material. So once all the uh, RLOs were created on the connections platform, they were put together and then a course material was created from that. So um, that was a uh, another model of uh, using OERs in uh, ODL course development. So, I mean, these are the uh, three uh, models uh, I have experience in. And uh, what's good about these models, are that these are not conceptual. Uh, Wawasan Open University actually came out with course materials, three course materials, which were tried and tested over a period of over several semesters um, and using OERs. And um, if I'm not mistaken, during the past PCF, uh, um, Wawasan Open University actually received an award for innovation uh, with respect to using OERs in one of the uh, modules or in one of the course materials, which was the um, the model, I, the, the um, uh, course guide model or the wraparound model I was talking to you about. So this kind of gives you a little bit of thought in terms of how to go about uh, incorporating OERs into your course material, into your teaching and learning. And there are certain things which you need to be aware of, like licensing, openness, accessibility, the relevance of a particular material, and uh, desirability of a particular open education resource, and things like that. So um, I think uh, the um, the panelists will take the discussion further, and you know, kind of um, you know, try to come up with new models or hybrid models uh, which will allow you to create uh, uh, course materials using OER. So uh, with that, I would like to end my very short presentation. And once again, um, thank you very much for the opportunity.